restart just mm -hmm. click the got it on that and then um Good. I'm sorry, I'm going to We're going to get started here. Welcome. Welcome to tonight's lecture on uh, archaeology at Jeremiah Lee's Rip Kitchen. Uh, I'm excited to introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, first, we have Krista Baranek, who is a research scientist for the Fisk Center of Archaeological Research at UMass Boston. Uh, her primary research has been on rural Massachusetts in the 18th century, exploring questions of personal identity and the role of rural emergence, which made her the perfect person to lead this project. Uh, last summer, she led a team of graduate students from US, UMass Boston uh, for an archaeological investigation outside the mansion that I know a lot of you saw as you walked by. And she'll be discussing that tonight with one of her students, Cal McCoskey. Uh, okay. uh, Cal is a second year grad student in the historical archaeology program at UMass Boston. And she's planning to do her master's thesis on the material from Marblehead, which just makes her so excited. <laughs> And her specialty is in the identification and analysis of animal bones, which she'll talk a little bit more about tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Krista. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Um, and as uh, Jared introduced, I'm going to talk about the work we did last summer, some of the goals, a little bit of the process, so you understand um, how this work happens. Um, as the introduction said, I'm from the Fisk Center for Archaeological Research at UMass Boston, which is a research center in the anthropology department that focuses on historical archaeology. So the archaeology of the last 500 years, primarily in the Americas, and really heavily concentrated in the Northeast in particular. Uh, so as a state university, we, we take it upon ourselves to do a lot of work with the state. And we do team-based research so that we have a number of archaeologists there. Um, several of the people who worked on this project are in the audience because they are Marblehead residents. So John Steinberg and John Schoenfelder and Rita Shepard. Um, so they're all part of the team who brings all these different specialties and expertise, areas of expertise to bear on the research. And we work primarily with organizations like the Marblehead Museum with historic houses, with the National Park Service, the trustees of reservations, land trusts, descendant communities, um, the Nipmuc Nation, the Wampanoag. So groups to bring all of this sort of combined expertise to bear on the questions that matter to these community organizations and descendant groups. So that's our sort of general um, mode of operation. And this project started because uh, about a year and a half ago, Lauren McCormick contacted us when the museum was acquiring the brick kitchen to see what archaeology might be able to tell us about the museum's larger interpretive questions about the use of the brick kitchen, particularly possibly as a quarters for enslaved people who lived at the Lee Mansion property. And also potentially at the role of other laborers in the Lee Mansion, because this is a, we know that from Lee's probate inventory, he enslaved three individuals. We don't know much about their roles, but then a large house like this clearly had a lot of support. And so to try and tell more of the stories of more of the people who are involved with the Lee Mansion. So that's the sort of the primary goal. Um, but that's a tough archaeological goal because the Lee period of, say, 1766 to 1788, that's an archaeological heartbeat, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very tight window. So we are, we're looking for that, and that's a sort of a primary research focus. But the wonderful thing about archaeology is also you never know what else you might find. And of course, the Lee Mansion and the Brick Kitchen properties have a much longer history before the Lee Mansion and the Brick Kitchen were there, these were multiple urban lots owned by the Jackson families and the James families with houses and shops on them starting at about 1700. 
Lee acquired multiple parcels in the 1750s and 60s to eventually build the sort of consolidate and build the mansion lot. So there's the possibility of that learn for learning about early 18th century Marblehead, uh, about the Jeremiah Lee period. After in the 19th century, the mansion became the Marblehead Bank uh, and it had a residence and the brick kitchen became a series of dry goods and stores and, and other properties. So those may have archaeological signatures. And then, then in the 20th century, uh, the mansion, of course, became the Marblehead, part of the Marblehead Museum, and the brick kitchen became the Lichtman print shop and, and some other functions. So all of these different iterations have potentials to leave archaeological signatures. And even prior to that, there's the potential for older native occupation of Marblehead of with the rich coastal resources. So all of these time periods are possible in our archaeological exp explorations. Last summer, because this is a large property, uh, we focused on the area between the mansion and the brick kitchen. And we're going to come back this summer to swing around behind the rest of the mansion and, and go into the um, other side yard. So uh, archaeology is sort of a phased process. And we started doing sort of phase, early phase work on that, that small area this past summer. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today, this sort of first phase of investigations. So the very, very first phase of excavations was to get some baseline data, including this aerial photograph, which is a, a drone photograph, but also um, a bunch of sort of smaller aerial photographs, lower aerial photographs, um, surveying data so that we know exactly where we are. Um, these aerial photographs were tied into measurement systems so we can tell, so we can basically use them as map backgrounds. Um, and then we started putting together a geographic information system database so we could layer together the aerial photographs, the historic maps, um, our, our work areas. Is this a laser picture? Might be off, but it should be working. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So our work area is outlined here. And you can see the numbers in the margins here are numbers in the Massachusetts state plane grid. So anybody else can follow up on our work and know exactly where we did our work and we can follow up on our own work. So if we wanna come back and investigate something, we can survey it back in and know exactly where we worked. So the first step was, was creating all of this sort of layered digital data. And then we began a survey, a series of surveys of geophysical surveys the one you're seeing here is called ground penetrating radar. So this is one of our students um, dragging a ground penetrating radar unit. And this is the kind of maps that they produce where that little box sends radar waves into the ground. They bounce back when they encounter things of different um, densities in a way. Um, and the area you get a lot of energy reflected comes back as bright red. The area where all the energy goes through comes back as dark blue. And you can basically slice this data so you can get a picture at 10 centimeters down, at 20 centimeters down, at 30 centimeters down. And this one is at 115 centimeters down, so that's close to four feet, this particular slice. Um, and interpreting these images is in abstract is hard. So we, we don't know what these things are, but we decide to test them out. So the little black squares are our excavation units. And we decided to test out this, this really bright red reflector and see what it was. And that one turned out to be something. This turns out to be the remains of a blacksmith shop, about 10 feet by 10 feet when you measure the size and full of blacksmithing waste down at four feet below the ground surface. So how did it get four feet below the ground surface? I mean, we'll get to we'll get to that part. But other ones are harder to interpret. So so we test various places where there are reflectors. We test places where there are not reflectors. Um, all of this to try and uh, so this this ground penetrating radar and the conductivity survey we did two different kinds helped us decide where to place some of our test units. And also sometimes where to avoid, because these help us see later utility pipes and electrical lines. Um, 
and things like that. <laughs> so after the um, radar survey, we did a series of test excavations. And most of these are pretty small. You can see one here. These were, all of these small ones are about a foot and a half by a foot and a half, 50 by 50 centimeters. They're called shovel test pits uh, because we dig them with a shovel. And there are sort of our first tiny little windows into um, what's below the surface. I mentioned archaeology is a process that happens in phases. This is a way of getting sort of a first round of information. And for some of these, we'll come back and dig the larger excavation area as part of the second phase. Um, I was telling a couple people when we started, uh, before we started the talk, we've recovered about 10,000 artifacts in our two weeks of excavation. It's a huge number. This is the property where every single excavation unit had something interesting in it. And that is not, that is not always the case at all. Our field project last summer spent the first three weeks digging shovel test pits with nothing in them. So here we did two, two weeks and all of the all of the test pits had interesting things in them. Uh, so this is a very, very archaeologically rich property. And we've got evidence of many, many different periods of the property's history. Um, there are places where we have 19th century finds, particularly in the units back here between this sort of little kitchen addition and the back door. These all have sort of upper layers of 19th century material, including this little turn of the 20th century um, vaccination uh, vial that's labeled Massachusetts Board of Health. So this is from the very end of the bank period. And we have a number of other um, artifacts identifiable bottles from the same period, from that same cluster of excavation units. But oddly, the 19th century finds didn't dominate at this property. At many urban properties in particular, the 19th century just swamps all earlier periods, the 19th and 20th centuries. And here it really did not. So we have a, a very um, unusual opportunity to see the earlier time periods here. We had only a really very few places where we found so far the period trash deposits, almost entirely in the very upper layers of the units right there. And one of the reasons for this, um, it's not to say that we didn't find other Lee period things, but we didn't find much Lee period trash. And one of the reasons for that is that Lee had cobbled much of the yard space between the mansion and the brick kitchen. So this was a formal space. This is a very high quality cobbled surface. Um, it was meant to be swept clean uh, and kept neat. So not a place where you would find a lot of trash building up. Um, so we don't have many leave period trash deposits yet in this area, but in part that's because that's not the kind of space this was. Um, but we do have this great evidence of landscaping. And one of the things we want to try and understand better is how much of the yard these covered. So that's one of the questions for this year in combination with the geophysics and some additional excavations, we're gonna try and trace how far between, how much of the area between the brick kitchen and the mansion was cobbled. Now, some of this is difficult to know because those properties sort of split up in their history in the 19th century. So in some places it may have been disturbed by other activity, but we're gonna try and answer that question of how much of this space was a sort of a formal space. Um, one of the other giant leap period things that we found takes a little bit of explaining archeological methods to understand what it is and, um, and all of that. So the, oh, so before I go on to that, the cobbled surfaces we found in the test pits through here on either side of and deeper than the um, cobbled surface that's visible outside the side stairs right now. So these aren't very, these are fairly shallow. Um, they get a little bit deeper as you head towards the back of the property. But a little bit about sort of the archeological process here. We are looking for artifacts, but we do that, we're more, even more, we're looking for soil changes and to understand the soil deposition on the site. How did the, what artifacts are found together in what soil layers? How did this soil layer get here? When does it date to? 
How does the site change over time with the buildup of soil or trash deposits or the removal of soil? Uh, so we spend a lot of time very carefully measuring and drawing and recording things about the soil and taking it out one layer at a time. And we end up generating records that look like this. So this is basically a profile drawing, a sidewall drawing of one of our little shovel test pits. This is that cobble surface you saw on one of the previous slides, um, about four inches below the modern topsoil. So the leaf period where it is preserved here is very close to the modern surface. Um, and it's sitting on some bedding material. And about 10, 10 inches below the surface, we start getting this sort of thick, clean fill layer. And about 28 inches below the surface, we start to get this sandy fill layer with a bunch of like architectural debris in it, broken brick, mortar, plaster, things like that. And then starting at almost three feet below the modern surface and going to about four feet below the modern surface, we have a pre lee trash deposit um, and we, one of the things people always ask when we're digging on sites is, well, how deep, how deep do you go? And of course the response is, well, till you get to the bottom. <laughs> the bottom here is very, very deep. We didn't actually get to the bottom at any of these little holes because it's very hard to dig deeper than four feet down in a one and a half foot by one and a half foot <laughs> hole in the ground. Um, and even in a larger hole where safety, you have to make a very large hole to safely go below four feet down. So we never actually got to the undisturbed glacial pre-human layer in any of our test units on that lot. And the reason for this is because of something that we did. Before Lee owned, and please forgive my sketches, I am not an artist and I'm not a scale, but Washington Street slopes down the hill, right? And before Lee built the mansion, there were multiple other houses there. When Lee acquired all of these properties, if you go over there now, you'll notice that the Lee mansion lot is very level. And that as you walk towards the back of it, there's a big retaining wall and a drop off the property behind. So that levelness is something that Lee created to build the house. So he presumably demolished these houses and created a level surface, possibly with the material he dug out of the cellar, burying that slope where those old houses used to sit and the old ground surface. So we were digging down here. So we get down four feet to the dem demolished remains of the earlier houses. So this is really, really extraordinary, in part because it represents a giant amount of labor. Um, we are in the process of calculating the sort of the volume of dirt removed, moved to create the level mansion lot, but it is a huge work project mm -hmm. in 1766, which is all being done manually. Uh, so if we're trying to understand the labor that Lee commanded to build the house, we have to think not about just about the architecture and all of those specialized crafts, but about the volume of soil that was spread out across the site, in addition to probably demolishing multiple standing buildings um, first and sort of uh, spreading them about the site um, before starting this project. So one of the things that this has um, means is that we have exceptionally good preservation of the 18th century, the early 18th century landscape under a large area at the mansion lot. And this is really, really unusual because in urban contexts, and Marblehead in the 18th century was quite urban, uh, in urban contexts, that time period almost always gets blown away by later utilities, um, later basements. Here, instead of being cut into, it was capped and preserved. So you have a really exceptional block of preserved 1700 to 1750 across the street here. It's, it's really extraordinary. Now we don't know about the other side of the mansion yet for sure. We only know for sure about the area between the mansion and the brick kitchen, but even that extent is really quite unusual. And this area is full of um, stuff, obviously. So a wide range of the domestic ceramics, 
Um, smoking pipes, these are fragments of ceramic of clay smoking pipe stems. Um, animal bone, um, architectural material. So there are lots of things. There are also lots of evidence of how this area is laid out. And we also, we know, oh, sorry, just going back to the things for a minute. Most of the things we found are in little bits um, because these are things that were thrown out and trampled in the yard space. These photos are of things from our type collection to show you what the vessels of this time period would have looked like. But we've got a great range of coarse red earthenwares, which is sort of your Tupperware of the day. And those are these larger dishes and jugs and bowls and mugs. Um, we have stonewares, so these gray with a blue cobalt design. Most So the earthenwares could be locally manufactured uh, in Massachusetts, or they could be imported. The stonewares are probably mostly coming from Germany. And so here you've got a stoneware mug and a stoneware chamber pot. And we have fragments of all of those, a chamber pot fragment down there and mug rims and pieces here. We also have a lot of um, ceramic types that are very specific to the 1700 to 1750 time period. So these light colored with uh, brown squiggly lines, that's called Staffordshire slip decorated ware. It's coming from the Staffordshire region, region, region of England. It was a fairly nice, finely potted, made nice little fancy mugs and dishes out of it. And then in the sort of most refined, we have a white salt glazed stoneware of which we have lots of little pieces. And that was your finer um, dining plates and teacups and saucers. And then at the, probably the fanciest, we have a little bit of porcelain. Um, so here's a porcelain tea bowl and a larger <coughs> quantity of beautifully decorated um, tin glazed earthenware. The best picture of it is this blue and white material here is a hand painted tin glazed earthenware designed to look like porcelain in the blue and white, but sometimes also made with like, multiple colors on it. So that would be punch bowls and um, teapots and fancy chargers. So the, the, you have this great range of early 18th century domestic ceramics. And the only place there is, there's a suite of ceramic types that begin to be manufactured in the 1760s. So a diagnostic of the Lee period. And we only have those in one area of the site so far, um, but that's an area we're going to come back to this year. But a beautiful, beautiful early 18th century assemblage. And we know that on this part of the property, these are associated with two generations of the Jackson family, uh, George Jackson, and then one of his three sons, Bartholomew, and Bartholomew's wife, Jane. And this is Bartholomew's late 1750s probate inventory. Um, and so much of the landscape features we see are associated with the Jacksons. So in addition to stock, the combination of these small test units and the geophysical survey lets us talk about the landscape also. So I want to show you, we've been looking at the, land, at the geophysical data again recently. Some of these things are modern. This is the electrical line, for example. So that's an avoid. Um, but this sort of red donut back here that we placed this unit on, that's probably a privy uh, or some other round filled feature. We got a tiny little window into it that last year. This is where a lot of the animal bones are coming from. And one of the places we'd like to go back to this summer. Um, over here, this I've already mentioned is a blacksmith shop, probably a little 10 by 10 foot um, shop on the pre 17, 65 surface. Now, whether that was, I don't know why that was there. I don't know if that was custom built to make things for the mansion or if that, you know, if was there so much ironwork in constructing the mansion that they, they built a shop? Or what was before? Oh, good. Because I haven't, I haven't found it yet, but, but good. I'll have to catch up with you um, afterwards. So we've got a blacksmith shop. Um, in other areas, you see this negative space here, this nice little square, and we put an excavation unit into that. This is one of the kinds of geophysics. And then here, looking at the same square, I'm having trouble doing this from an angle. 
The same excavation unit here, you see that sort of long red line next to it and turning a corner. That's, I believe, the foundation and the cellar showing up in sort of the negative here and positive for the cellar hole and the foundation wall of, I presume, the Jackson house um, that was here prior to 1760. Um, About 1690s, Yes, that's that's what I that's very consistent with the artifacts we have. We have some of the late 17th century artifacts. Um, and so yeah, that's very consistent with the artifacts we've got. So the analysis of all of this material is is underway. And one of the we've got a couple really extraordinary data types. The geophysical data is spectacular, enabling enabling us to do very targeted excavations that are very productive and then to tell us about the landscape. Um, and then one of the categories of artifact data that we have done the most with so far is the animal bones. And all, so Cal Mikowski is gonna talk about her research on the animal bones, but that's just one of the categories of stuff that could be looked into. The, the laboratory work is sort of a long ongoing process. So the bones, are really spectacular, but we could also do this, a similarly detailed process with the ceramics, so the smoking pipes. We just, the volume is such that we haven't quite gotten to them yet. So I'm going to stop for a minute and let Cal tell you about her uh, funnel research for the next little bit. Great. Hello, everyone. So as Krista mentioned, I'm Cal. I am one of the graduate students at UMass Boston. Can everyone hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Okay, great. So I am specializing in fall analysis, as Krista mentioned, is ah, so animal bone analysis. So before we get into more details about what I've actually discovered so far through this analysis process, I would like to give the disclaimer that all of the bones we're going to look at in a few moments are related, um, are from animals, and they are related to the consumption of food, um, and in general, to give more of a little bit of a broad overview of what fall analysis is, its faunal materials include bone, teeth, and shell. I don't specialize in shells, so I haven't really looked at any of the shells that have been recovered from the site so far, but I have looked at a lot of the teeth and bones, and it has been painting a very interesting picture, as we'll see in a few moments. But as, as Krista mentioned, um, there have been approximately 10,000 artifacts recovered during the summer 2022 field season, and about 2,400 of those um, are fall remains. So that is a significant um, proportion of the artifacts, especially considering preservation, which can, doesn't always occur on certain sites. And so we're very lucky at the Lee Mansion that we have such good preservation of fall remains, which lets us study food waste. So food waste is a concept that we study in broader anthropology, and I very specifically study it through archaeology, but it's all of these processes related to food. So how we consume food, how we acquire it, how we're conceptualizing our food, how we're preparing it, how food is distributed among populations, things like that. And all of these questions around food waste are kind of what is guiding my research of the fall remains so far. So this is an example of some of the fauna remains from one layer of an STP. Um, and this next slide is going to show you what's been identified out of that so far. So I figured it's a little bit of a crazy slide, but it creates a really good representation. So at that top, you can see there's a little bit that we can't really identify, but we have been able to identify a lot. Most of the deposits so far have been dominated by mammal bones. But we do have some fish and a lot of birds in some areas, which is fairly surprising. We're trying in the process of researching why bird may have been so popular at the site. But this particular assemblage, there is a lots of pigs. We have multiple goats represented here. Um, we have a cow and some other mammals and things like that. But it's just kind of give you that representation of how we make, will this go back to me? So how we take this, and turn it into a whole bunch of information based on what's there. And this is to show you, so this is a more up-close picture. So these are left um, goat or sheep femurs. So we tend to group goat and, uh, goat and sheep together because they are so similar. But on the left and in the middle are from the fist center type collection. So we have a very expansive zoo archaeology type collection that I'm using to prepare. Um, in the middle is a juvenile and on the left is an adult. And then we have 
one of those um, builder sheet uh, themers from that previous picture I showed you. And the reason why I in particular pulled a picture of that one left goat themer is we have two left goat themers, mm -hmm. which is tells us that there's multiple goats involved because you can't have a goat with two left themers. <laughs> um, well, you most of the time, but <laughs> yeah, so we have that and that's kind of give you more of the process of, um, oh, and this will pop it. So that's kind of showing the process and something we look at. So here, oftentimes we'll have to do the process of the analysis is we use landmarks, which are the different parts of bones. And these circles here are meant to show you the different portions of a femur and how we are able to match them up. And granted, it's a 2D image, so it's a little bit harder to tell. But when you have a three-dimensional bone in front of you, and if anyone pops up after and looks at any of the artifacts, you're able to see that a little bit better through the three-dimensionality of the bones. But by matching up those landmarks, that's how we identify those different bones. Um, and then to show you, so next I'm going to talk about one of the layers from um, uh, SCP 2215, which Krista mentioned earlier, is most likely a privy. We are really excited about it because so many things have come out of it so far. Mm -hmm. And we have from that one layer of where we think we have that little window into the privy, there are 13 different animals so far. Mm -hmm. And that's a significant number. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, and this is a, num a selection of those animal bones from that one particular layer of the privy. So you have a wide variety. And this kind of shows you a little bit more of um, that kind of what's going on here. So we have some birds, some, well, we have actually a lot of birds. We have seven different birds in this. We have about four mammals, one fish, and one turtle, actually. Um, so we have a little bit of an interesting variety. And so on that far on my left side, where you're right, is all different bird bones, which is fairly surprising because we don't typically find that many bones represented. And there's birds of all different sizes, as we'll talk about in a minute. So I jumped a little bit ahead, but this is kind of a visual breakdown of the different um, the different animals that are making up this one particular context. So there's 436 animal bones that came out of this one portion of the privy so far. Only 34 were not able to be identified, which is a fairly good track record. 13 different individual animals. So I, I said four mammals, seven birds, one fish, and one reptile, a turtle. Um, and to kind of give you more of that breakdown. So in terms of the mammals, we have one goat or sheep, one cow, one pig, and one fetal goat or sheep. So a little baby goat or sheep. And then in terms of our birds, we have a turkey, we have a chicken, we have a duck, a passenger pigeon, something from the auk family, something from the duck, goose, or swan family, and one really tiny little bird that hasn't been identified beyond the fact that it's a tiny bird just because it's so small, we can't tell. Yes. <laughs> of course, the fish number seems very low. Yes. Do they decompose more quickly? We are in the process of trying to figure that out, but not necessarily. Um, it's honestly been fairly surprising how few fish we have found so far. So that is one of the ongoing research questions I have is if you're in such a coastal environment, why are there so many birds and mammals and relatively no fish? So the fish is money. Um, so this is kind of the little conclusion of this feel I have so far. So a lot of it has been just mammals, um, but the very surprising number of birds. So with this, the future research questions I have, and this is going to be part of the ongoing thesis research I've been doing, um, and it's also as part of my graduate research assistantship, which has been very lovely, supported, a lovely, I guess. Thank you to the Marblehead Museum for supporting me. Thank you for helping to fund our research. Um, so this is what I've been doing with all of that stuff. So a big question I have is, what was the diet of the late 17th and most of the early 18th century of Marblehead Lake? especially this material would not have been related, at least what I've analyzed so far has not been related to the Jeremiah Lee occupation of the site. It's all been the Jackson family. We have one context of specifically related to Jeremiah Lee so far. And all we know is that there was a pig. That's all I've gotten so far, just because it's that small window. So one of our big research questions for the summer is what were the what was the food of the Jeremiah Lee family and their time period um, here? Like, so those big questions, what was that diet in general, like, especially for surgeons? Um, a big thing is how did people acquire and prepare their food? And that goes into that question about fish and why there's so few fish and did they just really like bird? Um, and 
a research factor with that is I'm going to be looking at colonial cookbooks and recipes and things like that and seeing if there's um, historic trends or anything like that. A uh, question that ties in ceramics and something, as much as I love animal forms, I also do really love ceramics, especially when you have such beautiful ceramics. How was food served? How was it stored? Things like that. And that's why I have this picture of animal bones along with ceramics to kind of uh, show you how we can have both types of artifacts almost speak to each other through our research. Um, what cultural factors are contributing with food waste present? So obviously, turtle head, it's on the water. Um, researching more into like the history of this beautiful town here and figuring out how all the cultural factors at play are related to that. And specifically, why are birds so important to the site's occupants? And why are there so few fish? So a lot of that will be diving into what we can find about the Jackson family and going forward the family on the other side of the lot. But that wraps about what I have. Chris, is it gonna hop back to one of your slides? Yes. Okay. And I will turn it back over to Krista. Yeah, and the, the preservation is very good. So these bird bones are, are a surprising preservation. So since the bird bones are preserved, we would expect the fish bones to be preserved if they had been there. And we have a couple fish ear bones in different yeah. contexts, which are identifiable to species. We have cod. When we have fish, yeah. it's cod. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Not surprising. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I think the last thing I wanted to talk about were a little bit like what's what's next? Where are we in this process? Clearly, the lab work is still ongoing. We've washed our 10,000 artifacts individually, every single one, um, and counted them and put them in numbered bags and identified them. But now we're really into the analysis phase. So Cal's working on the animal bones and we need to work on the ceramics and the glass and the smoking pipes. And the architectural material. So all of these analyses will keep going, uh, but we're also planning additional field work for this coming summer. And that's going to start, that's going to be sort of two types. We're going to do the same kind of survey process as we did last year on the other side of the house. So we're going to swing around to this other side of the back and, and this yard and do a geophysical survey and dig those small test excavations and see how similar or different the deposits on this side of the house are. We're also going to come back to a couple of key areas on this side. This is that privy that has such good animal bone preservation, and we want to learn more about the structure that it's in, too, um, because we really just caught a little edge last year. We're going to come back to this area where we have new period deposits and where we seem to possibly have a little outbuilding also, an early outbuilding made of stacked field stones, which we get again clipped a corner of. And so we're going to do a sort of a larger excavation there to learn more about that. And we're going to explore how far the cobbles in this area sort of extend across the lot and whether we can learn about whether they they're not present over here but we don't know if they're not present over here because they were never there or because they were there but were disturbed in the 19th and 20th centuries so we're going to try to learn that definitively but we're doing all of it also with a sort of a preservation mindset because the marblehead museum and historical society they you guys are preserving and conserving this lot and archaeology is inherently destructive so we're not going to dig up more of it than we have to, to answer targeted questions. We don't want to dig up large areas sort of just because. We could come back to every single one of these excavation units and learn a lot more, but this site is protected and preserved, and so we're being very um, targeted and conservative in where we're doing more excavation. And so we've decided on these particular goals in conversation with the museum um, to answer a couple specific sets of questions. Um, so come visit us in June. We'll, we'll be here on weekdays during June. And I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved, the field crew and students and the other collaborators at UMass and of course the Marblehead Museum and everybody who made this possible. And I think, um, Lauren, do you want to jump do in? Do you right want to take here? questions first? Yes, I'm happy to okay. take questions. And then I'll I jump think in. Cal and I are both happy to take questions. questions. Yes. Um, do you find the, the fish 
he said that he did come from other sites. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The fact that you don't see very much of it. So yeah. that is going to be related to how they were actually consuming and using animals at the site. There are sites where fish will dominate the assemblages that we find. It's going to be very much so related to what food they were consuming and things along those lines. In terms of a comparison, I don't necessarily have to have a site. I'm in the very early phase of beginning to compare this because we're in such early analysis phases, beginning to prepare, uh, compare that. And... I'm in the process of trying to figure out all of those sources for comparison. The big one I've looked at so far is House of Seven Gables in Salem because it has this very similar maritime history to it. But in terms of that, it's more so just related to how they were consuming food. Apparently, they liked birds a lot more than they liked to eat fish. <laughs> <laughs> Whether there's any use for fish in some of the shops. Yes, birds were. <laughs> yeah, and those are specifically tiny fish. Yeah, so so we've had so far we've had cod represented, which is not surprising, but I think it's more so just related to they were disposing of household waste. So that's what it would be related to. And sometimes, what affects the bones you find on the site are is your source of your animals. Are you raising your animals on site and butchering them on site, and so you get the full representation of the bones. Or are you getting cuts of meat or partial animals from another source? And one of the things that's um, surprising about urban, 18th century urban contexts in some other places is how many animals were being raised on urban house lots throughout the 18th century. So this has been pretty extensively studied in Charleston, South Carolina specifically. Um, mm -hmm. But that's one of the questions for here is where is this where is this meat coming from and how does that affect the parts of the animals that we find here? My daughter house was built in 1721 and when they were doing something for uh, an area in the back to make it more of a, a patio type thing, they found quite a few animal bones. And they found out that, that that was a slaughterhouse. It's on Green Street. That was a, I, and I don't know the time period, but the house was built in 1721. Are you interested in knowing anything about that? I mean, they might have been getting their yeah, stuff down the street. Yeah, I think the landscape of animal consumption in Marblehead, yes, we are interested about it. About one of the buildings on the corner of this lot was a butcher shop when Lee purchased it. One of the several little shops was, a, was also a butcher shop. So, so yes, that is something we, we would like to map out, like the sort of the meat consumption landscape. Um, I was intrigued by the reference to the Jackson House Foundation. Did the part that you um, encounter Give you any idea of its location within the overall foundation? So you could have a general footprint of what that house was like and how the current adjacent, the current buildings overlay it. So I think we're seeing a corner. Um... I think it was probably a house that had a cellar under one of two parts and that we are seeing the cellar and one corner with the corner being this red reflection right there and the cellar being this. So possibly it would have continued off this way. But this is kind of a bit speculative because the unit that we dug was entirely inside the cellar. So we haven't actually seen- So you haven't gotten down the stirrup. No, it was too deep to, to do in the size unit we had. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the relate, so, but you have an external grade and then you have an excavation to <laughs> where you had to stop. Mm -hmm. How great a differential is that? Do you have an- I'm just curious about the historic topography and... So we started to get buried ground surface. Um, here, our buried ground surface was four full feet below the modern ground surface, and it was not much shallower here. 
just under four feet. And we were well below four feet below the modern surface here. So which is what makes me think we're inside a basement. But yeah, in that part of the property, the historic grade is four feet below what you see currently, which is very consistent with that drop off at the back of the property. Um, and even, even a bit lower. So it's a brick foundation all the way down or is we, it? We haven't seen any of it yet, but there are displaced field stones in the cellar. So I think it's probably a field stone foundation. Okay. So. I could probably so, quiz you for an hour, but <laughs> someday we will see more of it. But yes. So the, the cobbled area that you bought now, or you want to cover it back up again once you've completed your research. So um, we lose the, the benefit of obviously seeing that in the future. Um, and there are no plans to, you know, to expose it all then. This would be a long-term question for the museum. We cover things back up when we're done excavating them as a matter of safety. Um, and I think there are multiple areas where those cobbles have been cut through by gardening and utilities and other things like that. So there is not an intact, there's a surface with holes in it there, but it does exist over a bunch of the property and it is very shallow. Um, so that would be a sort of a long-term question for the museum. Um, it's not it's not deep, it's four inches, four to seven inches below the modern surface. So I think can I just comment that I think there's a lot on the table in as far as landscaping when all is said and done with I mean, we wouldn't want to do anything right now anyway because of the construction for the new building that's gonna take place would just destroy it's gonna, you know, destroy the ground cover. Um, and also, you know, it'd be something we would want to do in conjunction. With with Kristen and the archaeological team, as far as what do we, what's why would we want to keep the original undercover and maybe reproduce on the surface might be one way to go rather than uncovering the original. But that's something that we would hopefully be able to talk about as we get a little bit closer to finalizing the landscape, because part of the goal is to bring back the space in between as much as possible, um, with multiple considerations, of course. Um, to what might have been experienced by the Lee family in the in the 1760s um, and 70s. Yeah, and we have up in this unit, we have a little bit of a much less formal cobble surface. So I don't know if it's because there were very formal cobble surfaces in some places and much less formal cobble surfaces in others, or if it's because the one up there has been disturbed more heavily or if it's because it was essentially the behind the line of you know formal you know formal space to the front informal space to the back that's something we hope to learn a lot more about this summer to try and characterize i do have some questions on the web um okay, just wanna, oh, go ahead uh yes sorry no i just go ahead to add when you were talking about restoring that space in between, are you talking between the brick building and the lean mansion yeah. that you want to make that yes. Yes. and open up so we can understand what that looked like? Exactly, because okay. I think that tell, I think one of the things I'm most personally interested in is the story we can tell through the landscape and how different people who lived and worked there experienced that so landscape. Like yeah, exactly. Then. Right. Uh, one question online is what what do your findings thus far tell you about the slave quarters, about the brick kitchen? <laughs> so close to the brick kitchen, we have lots of 19th and 20th century disturbance. So we don't have much in the way of intact deposits in these tests that were closest to it. So, so far, this area, which we plan to come back to, is probably our best shot for finding out about the activity that took place sort of between the two kitchens, um, because we do have a little bit of 1760s um, trash in that area. And so, so far, what this has told us is where to look and where not to look. Uh, and we're following up on that this coming year. Another question, if the, if the building next to the if the building next to the original houses was a butcher shop, wouldn't that explain all the land mammals and bird bones more than 
what was eaten by the households? No, it was further. So there was a butcher shop, but it was further down of the block. Um, I'm trying to go back to the larger aerial photograph. So from what I understand from the um, land deeds, the butcher shop would have been down at this end of the property somewhere. Um, and probably does not affect the presence of all the animal bones in the really domestic deposit that we get behind the house because we don't have a deposit that's just animal bones. We have a deposit that's really mixed with your full range of, of household trash. So I don't think that these are, and I think you would probably, these don't look like butcher shop deposits. No, they're, and they're also just, we have a lot, but we also don't have the extent that you would see at like a mass butchery site. I feel like that would, you'd have like much more different parts of what you would see and you'd have much more of it, I think. I, on, and then especially considering that it's mixed with so much domestic garbage, I think that's the big indicator is how much of the domestic deposit there is alongside with it. Yeah, one thing you we will do to answer that is really tally up all the parts of the animals that are present and are, are the parts that are present the waste parts that get left behind at a butcher shop or the food parts that go with the cuts of meat. So if you see lots of the left behind parts, you might be at a butchering site. Whereas if you're seeing the parts that are being consumed, you might be at a, a site where people are eating it. Of course, this also is the question of about if you're raising the animal on site, you see all the parts. <laughs> um, but that's why you know we're identifying. You know, this is this is the shank. This is the ankle. You know, how do we have heads? Do we have feet? Um, because uh, questions about the not less, oh, of course, heads and feet were quite able in the 18th century too, but yeah, but the questions about the parts sort of address that question. Yeah, and so far, a lot of what we've identified is what, so Dr. Dave Landon is one of the zoo specialists we have at UMass, and we have been describing, and what we've, because what we've seen so far is a lot of goat and sheep leg parts, so we have a lot of leg of lamb, yeah. and so some delicacies like that, and with the bird bones, it's, we have little tiny, like, passenger pigeon bones, with, like, a couple cut marks that might be related to actually taking meat off of the bone while you're mm -hmm. consuming it, rather than butchering it for cooking, and one of those big things with the question of that is the type of butchery marks we see is something being completely hacked off because you're removing a limb off of an animal versus is this a mark you're seeing because someone's taking a fork and a knife to it or you're are you throwing it to a dog that it's chewing on or anything like that so we see those very different marks and that helps clue us into how mm -hmm. it's actually being consumed as well yeah that's most of the, the questions don't seem to be blocking in anymore um i want to really say thank you so much to the lauren museum and the funders to make this possible and to you all to make it happen. Those of us who have been involved with this fight for decades, we wanted to do this for, for forever. And Betty went before me. It's, it's been a long time coming, so thank you. It's a really great site. Yeah. And, and and one just one comment about fish question just to pursue that a little bit more because fish was the commodity that Marvel had made, which was a verb. To, to sell, to trade, that was our livelihood. There doesn't seem to be a part of eating the fish in, in most families, but common families are eating a lot of pork. Pigs are everywhere. They're the garbage cans, they're the garbage collectors, they're the garbage processors, and they reproduce fast, and it was an easy source of protein and food. The higher level folks, you're going to be telling us more about <laughs> what they're eating. But that's one aspect of the fish question. Okay. It, it was quite an impact. Well, thank you. And I would say so far, the amount of pork we've seen as well would definitely follow suit along with that mm -hmm. idea. So thank you very much for that. There's one more question in the back. I just have um, sheet in addition on the back of the wing. It seems like that might be right in the middle of a pretty huge. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there a foundation? Is there some way you know? So have you looked at this? Lauren, I put in there with flashlights this last summer. And I think the kitchen addition is a wonderful um, feature because it doesn't have a basement of its own. It has a fairly superficial foundation. And so it will have actually protected those shallow lead period deposits. So my suggestion was that at whatever point in the future you need to do repairs to the flooring 
or underpinnings of that addition that we tie that in with archaeology because it would be very difficult to get in there under the existing floors. But if there was a period where you were doing work and we're going to take up some flooring, that would be a very logical point to do some testing. So the cross thing is you can up here. We've thought about it. it it's, it's close, but I would prefer to wait. <laughs> yeah, especially with all the animals we find down there or the smell of the animals. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm going to jump up for a second. First of all, thank you both so much. And thank you all. And John and John and Rita. And all the students who are not here, but who did um, amazing work in, in just two weeks. When they came in, they said, we have 10,000 artifacts in just two weeks. <laughs> It's craziness. And what is it? What is the lab time equivalent for the amount of? Can you so, remind me? Yeah. So for every person day in the field, it generates three to five days in the lab. So five people for ten days. That's um fifty person yeah. days. Yeah. Fifty person days times times five. So that's twenty five hundred lab days. So multiple jobs here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, graduate students. Graduate students. <laughs> And that's and that's the thing. That's the thing about working with uh, UMass Boston and the Fifth Center and these amazing yeah, folks the is that they offer us so much and they ask so little of us in return compared to for-profit institutions that can do this work as well. But and the fact that we are supporting grad students and that we have a grad student doing a thesis on us is pretty amazing and it's super exciting. And you saw the possibilities that we have for this upcoming summer. And so I'm so appreciative that they're willing to come back. And hopefully this is just the start of a long-term relationship. So we're going to have to figure out a reason to dig up the, the <laughs> kitchen and <laughs> floor so we can get them down there and summers to come. But so here's where I have to do my job. And on your chairs, you all have a little bit of information about what this upcoming summer is going to be like and what it's going to cost us. And there is some fee involved, but like I said, it's so much more inexpensive than if we went any other route. And it's really the only way we're able to do this. So if you are able and willing to help us out, and so many of you that are in this room right now and are on Zoom, were responsible for helping us get in here in the first place this past summer. But I am gonna make the ask again. If you are able to help us, there's a pledge form, there's an envelope. You don't have to do it now. You can mail it back in. If you do wanna do it now, uh, on the desk in the front on your way out, I put a big fishbowl and you can shove that pledge form or envelope in. And I do thank you ahead of time. And I thank you all who did give to make this possible in the first place. I hope you're very happy with the results so far. And 100% of our future costs is money that goes to graduate students. So it's not my salary it's, or anything. It's specifically fund graduate students. Right? So you are, you are funding the future of, of archaeology and, and his, historians throughout this area. And on so, behalf of the graduate students, I thank you. <laughs> How do you say Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. And That's the question. And then, then, oh, there's some things up here. Can they come and look at those? Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, and you guys can maybe ask some more questions if you're happy. Can you come up? Can around here? My first hand. You said that's behind the house. My first hand is that I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can do that.